Welcome. Today is June 6, 2023, and welcome to your City Hall. It is 6 p.m., and this is our City of Iowa City's formal meeting. I'm going to call this meeting to order. Roll call, please. Alter? Yes. Burgess? Here. Here. Dunn? Here. Farmson? Here. Taylor? Here. T? Here. Thomas? Here. All right. Well, our first item is 1A Proclamations. 1A is Juneteenth, National Freedom Day. Whereas President Abraham Lincoln signed the Emancipation Proclamation on January 1st, 1863, declaring persons enslaved in Confederate territory free, paving the way for the passing of the 13th Amendment, which formally abolished slavery in the United States of America. And whereas on June 19th, 1865, almost two and a half years later, Major General Gordon Granger arrived in Galveston, Texas and announced the end of both the Civil War and slavery. And whereas Texans began the celebration of Juneteenth in 1866 with community events such as parades, cookouts, prayer gatherings, musical performances, and historical cultural readings, some communities purchased land for Juneteenth celebrations such as Emancipation Park in Houston, Texas, and as freed families immigrated from Texas to other parts of the United States, they carried the Juneteenth celebration with them. And whereas June 19th has a special meaning to African Americans, and is called Juneteenth, combining the word June and 19th, and has been celebrated by the African American community for over 150 years. And whereas beginning in 2022, the city of Iowa City officially recognizes Juneteenth as a city holiday. And whereas Juneteenth reflects our community's deep belief in liberty and equality for all individuals. And whereas Juneteenth celebrates the strength and resolve of African Americans throughout history and is an opportunity to honor African American culture, art, history, and achievement, as all benefit from a greater understanding and appreciation of the experiences of others. And whereas the City of Iowa City, Johnson County Black Voices, and many other organizations are hosting free public events to commemorate Juneteenth, details regarding all events can be found on the City of Iowa City's website. Now, therefore, I, Bruce Teague, do hereby recognize Juneteenth, 2023, as Juneteenth National Freedom Day in Iowa City and would encourage all community members to participate in this commemorative event. And we just want to say um, to all of those that are going to be a part of this celebration is going to be held downtown on Friday, but there is many more events. So we would ask that you go to the website to see all of the opportunities that our city is um, and our county is actually having in honor of Juneteenth. So we'll just give a hand clap for Juneteenth. <laughs> Proclamation 1A2 is LGBTQ plus Pride Month. Where is LGBTQ plus Communities across the nation annually celebrate pride in their culture and community in the month of June. And whereas the annual celebration of pride began as a collective protest for the rights of LGBTQ plus individuals and communities. And whereas the national tradition of celebrating pride in June is a tribute to the Stonewall riots of June 1969 in New York City, which are remembered as the launch of the modern LGBTQ plus rights movement. And whereas transgender persons of color, including Marsha P. Johnson, Sylvia R Riviera, and Storm Delaveri were primary leaders in the Stonewall expression of just treatment for the LGBTQ plus people and gave their work and lives to the cause. And whereas the city of Iowa City recognized that many LGBTQ, LGBTQ plus lives that continue to be lost each year in pursuit of living out their authentic identities, in particular, transgender persons of color, and whereas the city of Iowa City welcomes and accepts persons of diverse sexual orientations, gender identities, and gender expressions, and is proud to celebrate the contributions and culture of all residents. 
And whereas each year, Iowa City Pride brings together thousands of LGBTQ plus persons from across Iowa and beyond to celebrate their shared identities and experiences. And whereas Iowa City Pride is celebrating its 54th annual Pride anniversary and the 55th anniversary of Stonewall this June, and whereas Iowa City Pride is host, will host its annual Iowa City Pride on June 17th in downtown Iowa City, and I would encourage all to attend the celebratory event, which includes a parade. Now, therefore, I, Bruce Teague, Mayor of Iowa City, do hereby proclaim the month of June 2023 to be LGBTQ plus Pride Month in Iowa City and encourage all to reflect on the ongoing struggle for equality, members of the LGBTQ plus community face and celebrate the the contributions that enhance our city. And to receive this is Joe Riley, who is the current president of the Iowa City Pride. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Mary Teak, uh, Council. Um, thank you for continuing this long story tradition we have here in Iowa City of having an inclusive community that is positive and affirming. And uh, that's part of our message this year is we are stronger together and we're sharing our experiences. We are visible. We are present. We are represented. Please come out June 17th. Uh, it will be a long day of activities, fun and entertainment. Uh, kicking off with a parade at noon. It's shaping up to be perhaps our largest festival yet. Um, so now in our 53rd year, is one of the oldest prides in the United States. We are very proud to continue being that for this community and for these members of our Iowa City community to come out and share their experience. Thank you. Thank you, and here is the proclamation. We're going to move on to our consent agenda, which is items two through seven. Could I get a motion to approve, please? So moved. Taylor. Second. Alter. And anyone from the public like to discuss a topic that is within our consent agenda? If so, uh, please uh, come to the podium. If you are online, please raise your hand. Say no one online or in person. Council discussion. Roll call, please. <clears throat> Taylor? Yes. Teague? Yes. Thomas? Yes. Alter? Yes. Burgess? Yes. Dunn? Yes. Harmson? Yes. Motion passes seven to zero. We're on to item number eight, which is our community comment. This is an opportunity for anyone to speak on a topic that is not on our agenda. So if you're present, we ask that you come on up and you have up to three minutes. Um, there is a sign-in sheet at the table. Also at the back of the room, there, there are stickers that you can pre-fill out your information. We ask that you state your name and city you're from. Welcome. Hey, City Council, it's so great to see the Family Folk Machine uh, perform at the Engler uh, just a few weeks ago. It was really brilliant, and uh, some of our counselors really have beautiful voices. And they sang all kinds of things, from folk music, Irish music, would have made my dad happy to see that, soul music, uh, Bohemian Rhapsody, no. Um, Laura Burgess and uh, our mayor, uh, both really showing quite the community spirit and their vocals, and I loved it. Man, be involved, you know? That's a great group. So first of all, I'd like to say that. Thank you so much for being part of that. Made my day. Uh, second of all, yeah, Juneteenth. That's cool. Uh, I'm for Juneteenth. I'm against racism. I'm for democracy. I'm against fascism. I think we should celebrate the day. But, you know, we always say we're going to have a day. You know, one day out of 365, we're going to have that day. But man, we should have 365 days where we respect people of color, LGBTQ, uh, and we should work all year long. I mean, we say Juneteenth, you know, cool. It's great to celebrate. But really, 
you know, we live in a state where we can do a lot of stuff to, to show our appreciation by helping people who are on the outs, which, you know, when we talk about people of color, we know that they are disproportionately uh, imprisoned. We have the largest prison population in the world as a country. We have the largest population per capita in the world, and that's something that we can work on. And uh, LGBTQ, uh, I feel the same. Um, this is kind of loose, loose leaf for me tonight. I would say uh, those of you who are outside have been breathing the, the air, which is a lot of Canadian uh, wildfire burning. Uh, a lot of Canadian cities burning, a lot of uh, climate change going on out there. Just as a reminder, we have to keep working on our Congress and Senate to do better uh, in this area, and we have to do better at home. And uh, I just read this statistic just for fun. Uh, I know you guys want something trivia tonight, but our military pollutes more, more carbon footprint than 140 countries combined. No? Now, we've, we're spending about a trillion on military, yet we're cutting food stamps. I think we can do something there. I love all you guys. You're super cool and groovy. Keep working at it. You'll get it right. Thank you. Thank you. Welcome. Hello. Please state your name and city you're from. Hi, my name is David. Uh, my last name's kind of long, so you can see it in the guest book, but uh, I live in the east side of Iowa City. So uh, first things first, I'd like to apologize uh, since I don't think I did a good job explaining my uh, issue with the Capitol Street ramp at the last meeting. And um, I was a little nervous because I've also never addressed a city council meeting before. <laughs> so uh, basically all I, and I hope other motorcyclists are asking, is for the parking department to please uh, shorten one of the exit gates at the Capitol Street ramp so that we can exit the normal way like we used to. Uh, which I think is much, much safer. <laughs> so uh, to be clear, I don't think this was done intentionally. Um, I think it was just an unintended consequence of the new uh, parking system. And so um, I brought up my cost and emissions estimates to show why I love motorcycling and why I've continued to do it for the past four years, even though I don't really have to anymore. But um, I think it may have come off as being a bit selfish since um, I understand that not everyone wants to take the risk. Um, and um, if I had to choose between my car and bike, it would be a really hard choice because uh, I haven't yet ridden my scooter to Costco. And uh, <laughs> unfortunately, I don't live in the South anymore. <laughs> And so uh, that being said, I'd like to really thank the city for increasing my uh, bus service frequency to, to uh, every 20 minutes. Um, I really appreciate it. And um, I strongly support the uh, zero fare transit pilot project. Um, and so to conclude, uh, I understand that there will be a public hearing on uh, making improvements to the city parking ramps on the 20th. Uh, Unfortunately, I can't make it. Um, I'll be spending Juneteenth on a plane to Boston for uh, going to a conference. But uh, I'd really appreciate it if my uh, suggestion on improving the safety of the Capitol Street ramp can be discussed. And so uh, thank you, and I uh, yield the rest of my time. <laughs> thank you. Welcome. Hi, how you doing? All right. My name is Sherman, and I'm from Iowa City. And uh, I've been coming to these meetings uh, for a while. And tonight, I would like to begin with an analogy. When neglected or left unattended, our beloved pets will turn feral. Even baby will turn wild just to survive. 
but can the man of mind go feral when forced into survival mode? When we have to make choices we wouldn't normally make, when we have to survive our animal instinct, what kind of metamorphosis happens to man? Do our minds go feral? Some of us reinforce our living structures. Some of us arm ourselves. Some of us succumb to the introduction of the new elements, such as drugs and violence, either having to use violence or drugs to survive or becoming a victim of their forced environment. I've been coming to these meetings since May the 2nd, calling for the investigation and audit of Chrissy Candinelli and Shelter House and past and present staff. They don't seem, they don't sit you up to succeed. They sit you up to return, to be a part of the recidivism rate and the city of Iowa city and its citizens will continue to give money into a broken system, a sinking ship. I implore this council to inspect the following documents of 501 and Shelter House, bookkeeping records, balance sheets, donation records, receipts, tax write-offs, income documents, payrolls, invoices, account balances, management's account, and reporting systems. Chrissy, you should be transparent and above reproach. Reveal your budget and expenditure. Answer the taxpayers. One day you will say, maybe he's onto something. Maybe we should sort this out and ascertain what's true. By the time you realize I'm not going to be silenced and go away, I'll be campaigning against you and your services will no longer be needed in Iowa City. Thank you. Thank you. Was there correspondence by chance? Okay. Can I get a motion to receive um, correspondence? So moved. Alter. Second. Done. All in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion passes 7 to 0. Anyone else like to address a topic that is not on our agenda today? Seeing no one in person or online. Thanks to everyone that spoke today. We're going to move on to items number 9A, building code update, ordinance amending Title 17, Chapter 1, building code by adopting the International Building Code 2021 edition, including Appendix K, and the International Residential Code 2021 edition, including Appendix F and Appendix J, and pro providing for certain amendments thereof, adopting Section 103.6, of the Code of Iowa and Section 105.4 of the Code of Iowa to provide for the protection of the health, welfare, and safety of the residents of Iowa City, Iowa in Title 17, Chapter 12 to clarify the process for building code appeals. And I'm going to open the public hearing and we're going to welcome our staff, Danielle. Thank you, Mayor. Daniel Sisman, Development uh, Services Coordinator. I'm joined tonight with my senior building inspector as well, Tim Hennis. Um, just to give you a brief overview of this agenda item, the Iowa City regulates the construction, alteration, relocation, enlargement, replacement, repair, equipment use, and occupancy of residential and commercial structures through the building permitting process and the adoption of building codes. Building codes are the minimum design and construction requirements to ensure safe and resilient structures. A model building code is a building code that is developed and maintained by a standards organization independently of the jurisdiction responsible for enacting the building code into law. A local government such as ours can choose to adopt a model building code on our own as our own, and this saves local governments the expense and trouble of developing their own code standards. The I codes, which are developed through a process facilit facilitated by the International Code Council, or ICC, are the most widely used set of model building codes in the, in the world, currently adopted and used in all 50 U.S. states, U.S. territories, and in many other countries. The I codes provide a minimum safeguard for people at home, at, at school, at play, and in, and in the workplace. The I-codes are revised on a three-year cycle through the Code Council's consensus code development process that draws upon expertise of hundreds of building and safety experts across North America. The codes are updated regularly to capture lessons learned from prior disaster events, new building and climate science research, and new technologies and practices. The state of Iowa imposes state-required codes upon lo local jurisdictions such as Iowa City. 
As part of the last code update we did in 2019, the city has amended its codes to conform to state regulations, requiring all local jurisdictions to adopt the state plumbing, state mechanical, and state electrical codes, and the state's adopted version of the International Energy Conservation Code, or IECC. Local jurisdictions do have the option of adopting the remaining state adopted International Building Code, IBC, and International Residential Code, IRC codes, or a stricter code as uh, determined by our jurisdiction. The ordinance before you tonight continues to adopt the required state codes and locally amended versions of the most recent editions of the IBC and IRC model codes. Included in your packet is a memo from Tim Hennis, our senior building inspector, highlighting the notable changes between the 2018 and 2021 editions of the model codes and our local proposed amendments. There are very few significant changes included in, the, in this code cycle. Many of the proposed local amendments simply maintain existing practices that we've had for many years. Um, the proposed changes were developed in collaboration with other jurisdictions in the Iowa City Cedar Rapids corridor to ensure as much consistency as possible. And the information about the code adoption process was also shared with our Iowa City Home Builders Association. Adopting the 2021 IBC and IRC codes with amendments as proposed will maintain consistency with national, state, and surrounding jurisdictions, <laughs> allow designers and builders uniform standards for design, protect, provide protection from many man-made and natural disasters, and guard public health and reduce property losses. The Board of Appeals at their uh, public meeting on May 1st, 2023 voted to recommend uh, approval of the ordinance as proposed, and staff does recommend adoption at this time. We're happy to answer questions if you have any. No questions. Thank you. Thank you Anyone from the public like to address this topic? <coughs> please come to the podium and state your name and city you're from, please. What I have to say is pertinent, but I moved out into town and campus apartments back in October. And at the time, there was water leaking into my apartment. When it snowed back in December, I had snow coming into my apartment. And when I would call the inspector, I, I called Mr. Uh, Leverman and everybody. They would tell me that they told them, say, well, I told them about this, you know? And I'm thinking, well, if you told them about this, why am I living here? Why don't I have a water heater? Why don't I have a furnace? I just got a water heater, sir, in April. And I've been there since October. I just got a new furnace last month, you know. But they say, well, we told them about it. You know, if you told them about it, why are they renting these apartments out? I think you're talking a lot about rental permit. Uh, which isn't the topic. This is building code update. Okay. That's why I, I didn't know. No, I understand. I, yeah. All right. Thank you. Right, thank you. <clears throat> yep. Anyone else like to address this topic? <clears throat> Seeing no one in person or online, I'm going to close the public hearing. Can I get a, get a motion to give first consideration? So moved. Done. Second. Harmson. Council discussion. I appreciate it hearing the collaboration with other communities so that there is consistent language at, and also including um, the Home Builders Association is who I think that they talk to. Roll call, please. Teague? Yes. Thomas? Yes. Alter? Yes. Burgess? Yes. Dunn? Yes. Harmson? Yes. Taylor? Yes. Motion passes 7 to 0. Item 9B, fire code update. Ordinance amending Title 7, Chapter 1, fire prevention and protection by adopting the 2021 edition of the International Fire Code to regulate and govern the safeguarding of life and property from fire, explosion, life safety risks, or health hazards. And I'm going to open the public hearing. And welcome, Staff Trey. Good evening, Council. Um, I am coming tonight to uh, update the International Fire Code from the 2018 edition to the 2021. The International Fire Code is also an I code developed by the International Code Council's model codes, which are published on a three year cycle. Uh, the proposed ordinance includes the most recent edition of the International Fire Code with local amendments. These local amendments reflect a new level of collaboration between the area fire marshals to create continuity. 
The cities of Iowa City, Corville, North Liberty, and Tiffin have taken efforts to closely align our local amendments so that a contractor is less likely to find different rules in different towns. Uh, the International Fire Code and the International Building Code refer to each other, and for that reason, Iowa City has always tried to keep the two codes on the same cycle. State law requires a public hearing on the adoption of a model code. Staff is recommending the adoption of the 2021 edition of the International Fire Code along with local amendments. A copy of the ordinance and the International Fire Code are on file at the city clerk's office. Um, the memo in your packet uh, details uh, the um, minutes to the Board of Appeals for our local amendments. That's all. Great, thank you so much. Any questions? Seeing none, thank you. Anyone from the public like to address this topic? Seeing no one in person or online, I'm going to close the public hearing. Could I get a motion to give first consideration? So moved, Alter. Second, Burgess. Council discussion. Well, I will say that, um, you know, the international codes um, do provide um, businesses in our community um, an expectation to provide safety. I myself went through uh, revitalizing a building and um, we were required to have fire sprinklers while that comes at a great expense. I really know that the, the, the real um, need for that is true, that there are codes in place to make sure that we protect uh, folks. And so I really appreciate um, you all continuing the work to make sure that there's um, I think collaborative language amongst uh, the the different communities, as well as uh, for those like me who are lay folk uh, that can understand what all of this means uh, in practical terms. So I really appreciate um, this these updates uh, that you all are doing today. Roll call, please. Thomas. Yes. Alter. Yes. Burgess. Yes. Dunn. Yes. Harmson. Yes. Taylor? Yes. Teague? Yes. Motion passes 7 to 0. Item 9C is Asphalt Resurfacing 2023. Resolution approving the project manual and estimate of costs for the construction of the Asphalt Resurfacing 2023 project. Establishing the amount of bid of security to accompany each bid. Directing city clerk to post notice to bidders and fixing time and place for receipt of bids. And I'm going to open the public hearing. And welcome. Thank you. Uh, I'm Mari Van Dyke. I'm with the Engineering Division. Uh, this project is an annual project that's part of our larger pavement management program. And so the goal of the project is to um, extend the life of pavement on older streets without having to fully reconstruct them. So the general process for the project includes uh, milling of existing asphalt and then patching any, or patching the worst areas of existing pavement and then curb and gutter repairs and curb ramp replacements and then the streets are overlaid with three inches of asphalt. Um, typically, we would have a handful of streets that we overlay each year, uh, but this year we kept this project a bit smaller so that we could use funds for other pavement management projects. Uh, for example, we're working on a design of for First Avenue to reconstruct a small portion um, north of Rochester, and so that will hopefully happen later this year. And then we're also looking at doing some extensive patching on Mormon Trek, which would happen later, later than First Avenue, but still hopefully in the near future. Uh, so back to the resurfacing project, uh, the majority of the work will be on Court Street. So uh, we would be overlaying between Elmira Street and Berkeley Lane. We'll also have a little bit of work on Gilbert Street where we will mill and overlay the pavement at the railroad crossing that's between uh, the bus barn and the forestry building. And then we'd also be chip sealing Taft Avenue between American Legion Road and Herbert Hoover Highway. The estimated construction cost is $600,000. The bid opening would be June 27th, 
we would award the contract July 11th, and then construction would be July to October this year. Uh, that's all. Oh, are there any questions? Thank you much. Anyone from the public like to address this topic? Seeing no one in person or online, I'm going to close the public hearing. Could I get a motion to approve? So move, Thomas. Second, Taylor. Council discussion. I actually just find it so amazing that, you know, it even while the work takes time, that the process of actually getting it bid to the contract one is so short. So <laughs> just one of those layperson types of observations um, that we think of these things as taking years in the making to figure out. Uh, but really, it seems it's it's kind of like the other way around. Is like get it out there, let them bid, and let's go. So, yeah. thank you. Roll call, please. Alter. Yes. Burgess. Yes. Dunn. Yes. Harmson. Yes. Taylor. Yes. Teague. Yes. Thomas. Yes. Motion passed to seven to zero. Item nine D is CDBG ADA curb ramp. 2023 resolution approving project manual and a, an estimate of costs for the construction of the CDBG ADA curb ramp 2023 project establish an amount of bid security to accompany each bid directing city clerk to post notice to bidders and fixing time and place for receipt of bids and I'm going to open up the public hearing and welcome staff Ethan thank you uh, my name is Ethan Yoder I'm with the engineering division. I'm gonna talk about the CDBG ADA curb ramp project for this year. Um, <clears throat> the project locations that we selected are gonna be at Broadway Street, at Cra Cross Park Avenue, Apple Court, and Sandusky Drive, uh, Davis Lane and Tracy Lane intersection, uh, Sandusky Drive at Davis Street and Bancroft Drive, uh, Hollywood Boulevard at the intersections of Delwood Drive, uh, both the east and west side, in Hollywood Court, and the last location is Ridge Street and Downey Drive. Uh, this project is going to generally include removal and replacement of existing curb ramps. Uh, at a few of the locations, there are no crossing or receiving ramps, so we'll be installing new ones to, for that. Uh, we'll, we'll be doing some full depth street patches, as well as final surface restoration and seating. Uh, the estimated construction cost is $155,000. Uh, this will be CDBG funded. Uh, the schedule is uh, bid letting is June 27th, uh, awarding July 11th with start date of July 31st. Uh, majority of it should be completed this fall. Some of it might fall outside of the seating window, so that would be completed in the following spring. Are there any questions? Hearing none. Anyone from the public like to address this topic? Seeing no one in person or online, I'm going to close the public hearing. Could I get a motion to approve, please? So moved, Burgess. Second, Alter. Council discussion. I can hear uh, Harry Olmsted say, yes. I was just yeah. talking yeah. about Harry. Yes, <laughs> absolutely. About, yes. About damn time. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Me too. It's always good to see these projects every year and know that our community keeps chipping away at this. And yes. Yeah. yeah. And since I live right in that area, it's like this is going to be really, really welcome just because they're well traveled and it will be nice to have them more accessible for more people. Mm -hmm. Roll call, please. Burgess? Yes. Dunn? Yes. Harmson? Yes. Taylor? Yes. Teague? Yes. Thomas? Yes. Alter? Yes. Motion passes 7 to 0. Item 9E is fiscal year 23, annual action plan amendment number 1. Resolution approving substantial amendment number 1 to Iowa City's fiscal year 2023, annual action plan. And we're going to welcome, um, well, can I get a motion to approve, please? So moved, Alter. Second, done. All right, and welcome Erica Coopley. Hello. Hey, Erica Coopley with Neighborhood Services. I'm also here to talk about the curb ramps. Um, so we are proposing to shift CDBG set aside funding to allow for our neighborhood improvement project to proceed this construction season. The city sets aside 75,000 of our CDBG funds for neighborhood improvements each year in our annual action plan, and we work with parks and engineering departments to identify projects. 
The proposed project is curb ramp accessibility improvements in the South District. Um, as Ethan discussed, the total cost of the project is about $150,000 and was initially intended to be covered by two years of funding, um, CDBG funding for FY23 and FY24. But we have the opportunity to start the project this construction season. Um, if we get, if we wait until we get approval of our FY24 funds, we won't be able to start probably until next summer. Um, so after speaking with our HUD representative, they suggested we shift funds to the project. So we, we look for unspent funds that we could use more quickly. Um, we have about 25,000 in program income that we wanna shift to this project. And then we also propose shifting um, unused CDBG economic development funds for FY23 to this project. We currently use those funds for small business technical assistance and applications are available on an ongoing basis. We don't have any pending applications right now, but we'll get another set of funding um, beginning on July 1st. Um, any increases to project funding over 50,000 or 25% of the total project cost triggers a substantial amendment to our FY23 annual action plan in accordance with our citizen participation plan. We've held a 30 day public comment period and have not received any comments to my knowledge. HCDC recommended approval of the amendment at their May 18th meeting. Um, staff also supports this amendment. We have strict timeliness standards with HUD and this will help facilitate um, quick spending of our funds and it will also get the curb ramps out to the neighborhood more quickly. Any questions? I just have a clarifying question. You said that <clears throat> the money that you would be using um, now is for the economic development grants, but there aren't any, and you'll have a new round of money available July 1st? Right, so we have $50,000 okay. for FY23, and it mm -hmm. hasn't been allocated or spent, so um, usually after two years it goes back into the pool, but we're gonna kind of put it back into the pool early, and then we'll have funds available July 1st, well, 50,000 available for um, anyone to apply. For the economic? Yes. Okay, thanks. Thank you. Anyone from the public like to address this topic? Seeing no one in person or online, council discussion. Roll call, please. Dunn? Yes. Harmson? Yes. Taylor? Yes. Teague? Yes. Thomas? Yes. Alter? Yes. Burgess? Yes. Motion passes 7 to 0. 9F, Zero Fare Transit Pilot Program. Resolution authorizing the city manager to initiate a two-year zero fare pilot project on all Iowa City transit routes. Can I get a motion to approve, please? So moved, Burgess. Second, done. All right, and we're gonna welcome our city manager. Thank you, council. Gonna continue on the mobility theme, building off the curb ramps there and talk about public transit. Uh, you actually spent quite a bit of work session time at your last meeting uh, discussing the possibility of a two year zero fare pilot project on our transit system. This resolution just formalizes uh, the, the decision that was made at that work session, which is uh, to proceed ahead with that two year pilot program. Um, uh, I'll highlight a couple of uh, aspects again uh, for the public here tonight, and then if you have specific questions, um, uh, Mark Rummel, our Associate Director in Transportation Services, was kind enough to join us tonight and uh, can help respond to uh, specific questions. Uh, zero fare um, transit systems are gaining more interest across the country, um, and based on implementation in other communities, we expect that uh, it could boost our ridership by 20 to 60%. Uh, which not only helps us meet um, uh, equity goals, but also climate action goals um, uh, that are both contained in your strategic plan. We do have uh, federal relief funds that are available to carry us through this two-year pilot program. However, we have not yet identified a sustainable funding source to take us past the two years. So our intention is to uh, run this program uh, uh, for a year and then report back to you. Again, it will be a two-year pilot, but we would start that review process and that, that actual discussion of whether to go beyond the two years or not in about 12 months from uh, whenever we launch. Um, at that time, staff will be ready uh, with some uh, options uh, in terms of uh, a sustainable revenue source for uh, zero fare transit, and you'll have the benefit of a year's worth of data uh, to look at to determine 
uh, the impact that it's had in the community. Uh, our hope is that we can launch this uh, uh, in the late summer or early fall of uh, this year. And uh, transit staff is uh, busy making all the preparation that's needed to, to uh, uh, shift to that zero fare system. Uh, communications is also assisting with the uh, branding and messaging that will behind uh, that will be behind that shift to, to make sure that the public knows that uh, the service level change is coming. So I'll leave my comments at that. And again, uh, Mark and I are able to answer any questions that you have tonight. What steps are left to uh, uh, to get this up and running? Sure. Mark, you want to come up? I'll start, and then you can you can fill in. Um, we have to work through some pass uh, logistics. We do have um, bulk uh, people that organizations that buy bulk passes. We also have to transition people that are on passes off of the zero fare system. We want to build a brand and a message uh, to be able to to put this out there uh, as well. Um, and I know passenger counting systems is is something that Mark is uh, also focusing on. So what have I missed there, Mark? Yeah, good evening, everybody. Um, really, as far as our hardware side of things, our, our game plan would be to just cover our current fare boxes at this point, um, rather than taking removing them completely. Um, if you remember when Darian did her presentation during the work session, she commented that uh, our current fare boxes are near the end of their useful life, and we're looking, if we don't go fare free, we will definitely have to look at um, um, purchasing and, and acquiring a new either fare box uh, total system or at least replacing the hardware that's in the, the buses that was going to come at a pretty hefty uh, price tag. So at this point, our intention would be to just cover those fare boxes. Like Jeff said, we still need to count riders for federal uh, reporting. So a couple options, we can use kind of old fashioned clickers or through our uh, bus tracking software and the tablets that are in the buses, there's a module that we can purchase for that, that CAN bus actually uses right now uh, that seems to work pretty well. But I mean, all in all, our, our bus schedules have rates on there. The website has rates on there. So it, it would really just be modifying some of those uh, aspects. We're not looking to expand the fleet or <coughs> expand our, um, our employee, uh, uh, our, our full-time employee count at this point um, due to demand, but that could be something that, that comes up down the road. And I know this is cart and horse because we haven't actually approved this yet, but when the, the communication sort of gets a plan, I would love to hear some kind of an update on how we're going to be pushing this out to the community. I mean, I don't expect you to have that tonight, but, sure. but when, that, when that comes, I'll be you know, really interested in hearing about it. On that same education theme, Mark, I, I heard you use the term fare free, and I've had a conversation with Jeff and a couple of my colleagues of zero fare versus fare free. So, um, I mean, personally, I like fare free, but of course, you're the professional. <laughs> sure. Yeah. We I don't know that we bus uh, fare free and BFF. <laughs> there you go. It's fair, it's free, it's fare free. <laughs> I like the ideas, so we'll have to figure out what, what we land on there. It's, you're right. You're right. City Has there been any communication with our neighboring uh, city, Corville, since this has kind of been out? I, I uh, reached out to their city administrator to let them know, and then we're also uh, engaged in discussions on uh, paratransit, on the, uh, the paratransit aspects of this as well. Any other questions? Thank you. Thank you. All right. Uh, anyone from the public like to address this topic? Please state your name and city you're from. Uh, David Ramotowski, Iowa City. So um, I guess I already said it, but I really do support the uh, zero fare uh, pilot project. Um, so I'm a PhD student here um, studying environmental engineering, and uh, and so. Uh, as I said before, I don't live in the South anymore, so obviously in the colder months of the year, uh, I rely on the bus pretty heavily because it does go right by my apartment, and so it's uh, very uh, convenient. And so um, so actually because of that, uh, so right now uh, I typically buy the University U Pass to ride the bus, and. Uh, and the thing is, I can't, it doesn't really pay for itself, except like in the winter, like when I'm actually riding the bus regularly. So, um, so for example, this summer, I actually didn't renew it. And so um, 
if I want to ride the bus, I'll have to actually, you know, carry cash and pay, and I don't really like doing that. So, um, so yeah, I think it's really great that you guys are considering this because uh, I did my master's. So, like, before I started my PhD, I did my master's in Raleigh, North Carolina, and the buses there ran once every hour, and that's in a metro area with, like, it, probably the same population as like the entire state of Iowa, and so uh, I think that's pretty sad. But it also, um, I just want to express my appreciation that you guys are uh, supporting public transit, and uh, thank you. <laughs> thank you. Anyone else like to address this topic? Seeing no one, in person or online, council discussion. <clears throat> I'm just tremendously excited that this is going to happen, um, and I commend staff for doing all the work to see if this is viable. And um, you know, this I just think that this is going to take some really large steps in terms of concretizing what it is that we want to do for our city in terms of accessibility, in terms of equity, in terms of um, making it a livable place. Um, working on climate goals. So it just, it hits everything. And um, it, this is just an awesome thing. So thank you everybody who's contributed and worked so hard to make this happen. I agree. And I think the combination of this with the increased frequency and the other changes that we've made uh, with the route adjustments and that kind of thing all happening in close, uh, close in time to each other, that marketing piece will be really critical and helpful because I think there's a number of people who just haven't tried the bus in a while or haven't ridden the bus uh, recently uh, after the, you know, so many people stopped riding the bus the last few years with the pandemic. So I think it'll be really exciting to see people uh, come back to riding the bus with a lot more new people riding the bus and not having to pay a fare. It's the one thing that I've heard a lot of positive comments from from the public about. They're, they're all excited about this too and, and I'm excited for our transit drivers uh, because I think this is going to be very helpful to them uh, as far as they don't have to worry about making change or uh, arguing with people about uh, how much to pay. So I think that's going to be very helpful and a big change for them. I think it's uh, important to go over just for the sake of, of this being the meeting we're making this vote on. Uh, some of the things that I really think that, and I know that the rest of this council shares, uh, are really critical to to going forward with this project. Um, so I, I've got three things that are that are really important to me and why I support this. So one, it's going to help us achieve our climate goals. It's going to keep people off of the roads, uh, you know, which it will additionally save us money, uh, reducing wear on our roads. Two, it will hopefully uh, help boost the local economy by keeping dollars in people's pockets. And two, in doing and in thir third, in doing that, it's going to help the poor and working people save money and spend it on other necessities. This is something that I've seen firsthand. Uh, I've been helping out uh, a local refugee who is 100% dependent on public transportation, specifically public transportation in Iowa City and Coralville, and. This person literally ran out of money because of how often she had to use the buses. And so when I think about this vote, I think about how many of those people exist in our community that this is going to have an immediate impact on being able to buy more food, being able to do other things that don't just simply get you to the job that you have. Um, so I'm, I'm very thankful for all the work that staff has done on this. I'm very thankful to uh, you know uh, the, the, the Biden administration uh, as well as uh, members of Congress for getting us these dollars and allowing us to do this really type of transformative work for our community. And I'm also looking to the future I, I don't think this should be the place where we stop with expanding public transportation in our community. Um, I think that we, we also need to be looking towards expanding service, but this is a fantastic, uh, great first step that I don't think should be overlooked. I can't think of anything to add to that, so I'll just say ditto. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I guess one, one thing I might add is it, it will be inter certainly interesting to see how ridership changes with the free fare um, and hopefully, you know, we'll see an, a significant increase. I think it will also be interesting to try to expand our horizon in terms of where, where might there be uh, development opportunities along these bus lines with the free fare, um, perhaps with, a, with an emphasis on affordable housing, 
since the means of transit would, would be free fare, uh, and, and see if that can accelerate, again, our, our movements um, on all the fronts that have been described uh, with regard to this project. So uh, that too, I think, is often when, when we make these transit enhancements and improvements, there is an opportunity to, to incentivize its use by aligning our land use uh, accordingly. And uh, we are certainly advancing our transit system. So it'll be interesting to see if we can take advantage of that. So often I say, let's be begin with the end in mind. And this isn't one where we have that. I think what we have at the end of, the, at the end of this uh, pilot program is faith and hope um, that we'll be able to do something. Because right now, um, the funds, you know, uh, we already saw that they will not uh, last. So how do we ensure that we have enterprise funds to make this up? But I'm happy that we're doing this, and I'm going to keep the hope and the faith alive that we'll be able to continue to do this for the people that Councillor Don just talked about. Um, very exciting. I'm happy to support this. And what I hope is that between now and then we'll see um, really what we're talking about now, more ridership. Um, and I would love to see um, how, you know, along the bus routes we can see some improvement uh, of um, places where people destined uh, to go in. So that would be interesting just to see how this play out, but happy to support it. We're ready for roll call. Harmson? Yes. Taylor? Yes. Teague? Yes. Thomas? Yes. Alter? Yes. Burgess? Yes. Dunn? Absolutely. <laughs> That is a yes. All right. Uh, motion passes seven to zero. Item number nine G is ARPA Child Care Wage Enhancement Program. Resolution authorizing the Merida sign a state and local fiscal recovery fund resolution uh, grant agreement with Johnson County and the Community Foundation of Johnson County to administer the child care wage enhancement program. And could I get a motion to approve, please? So moved, Alter. Second, Taylor. All right, and welcome, Cassandra. Hi there, Cassandra Grip, uh, Grant Specialist with Neighborhood and Development Services. Um, as you mentioned, uh, the, this resolution would authorize uh, the support of the um, Child Care Wage Enhancement Program through an agreement with Johnson County and the Communi Community Foundation of Johnson County. Um, this program addresses the growing challenges of child care staffing wages um, without increasing the cost of tuition or passing those on to additional costs to the families. Um, in addition to increasing the child care staffing wages by um, up to $2 per hour, um, the fund pays in, uh, the increased payroll taxes, so that, pa that is not passed on to the provider either. Um, this resolution um, was initially presented at a work session in March, um, and so this is the um, culmination of those planning pieces, um, and I'm happy to answer any questions that you might have. Has it been made public? I know that there is um, a local business partner who has committed that this is like a big get. Has it been made public who that is? No. Okay. Uh, we'll just have to wait with bated <laughs> breath, I guess. Sit so here, no more questions. Thank you. Thank you. Anyone from the public like to address this topic in person or online? So I guess you all are a part of the applicant in a way. I'll be the public today too. Okay. <laughs> Step her down. Welcome. Thank you, Katie Gerlach, Director of Better Together 2030 and a partner in the Child Care uh, Solutions Collaboration here with Missy Forbes from 4Cs. We've been a part of the Child Care Solutions Group for many years and out of the pandemic came the Wage Enhancement Program, which you're generously supporting with your resolution tonight. Wanted to say thank you on behalf of the entire coalition. Uh, with this support tonight, we'll be able to launch the official Child Care Solutions uh, 
Johnson County Community Collaboration brand through the business partnership, ICAD, and all the Better Together 2030 partners, which will allow us to go out um, and really publicize this with our business partners to be able to have a badge on their website, a sticker in their window showing that they are also a part of the solution. But we couldn't have gotten there without the city and county support and leading the way, and we're here to say thank you for that tonight, and we're looking forward to what the next three years does for child care in our, in our county. Thank you. Anyone else like to address this topic? Seeing no one else in person or online, council discussion. I think this is just like the last item, another example of something that people have worked on for quite a while, years. Um, and uh, now we're at a point where we're actually getting to take some action on things, and that feels really good, especially because many times when people ask me, well, what are you doing about this, what are you doing about that? And I said, you know, we move at the speed of city. <laughs> and sometimes uh, Iowa City actually moves pretty quickly on things <laughs> compared to some other cities I've lived in and covered as a journalist. Um, but it still takes a lot of time, and there's a lot of work. And so um, also just a pat on the back to all of those who have worked for weeks, months, and years to bring forward a proposal which should help us move the needle on a, a major issue confronting families, businesses, um, and, and children. So thank you. Something that's been a long time coming and we've been hearing about and talking about, but uh, a lot of a lot of words, but not much action. So it's really great to see this and, and hoping to see over time that, that it's helpful because we hear over and over again and see the effects that the lack of child care uh, does affect the economy. Uh, people can't go to work if they don't have the child care and, and those kinds of things. And and we'd heard the, the drastic numbers, it must have been at the work session that you were talking about, of, of the lack or the need for spaces. So it'll be interesting to see how this helps that. Thank you. I really appreciate how this program is in alignment with our partnership and engagement uh, value from our strategic plan so much, not just with the coalition that's been working so hard and pulling together so many stakeholders to come up with this idea, let alone the actual logistics of the program itself, but also the fact that two local governments are seeding this fund and it will be successful through the collaboration and support with private businesses participating as well. So my one question was going to be, how are we going to market it? And Thank you, Katie, for explaining that uh, now we can and that your organizations will be doing that. I think I'd, uh, I'd again echo a lot of the comments that I had for the last item. Um, this is just a really great program that we have the opportunity to participate in. It's going to make a really big impact on, on working families in the community. Um, again, speaking to a, a particular line from the, the agenda item, child care professionals have the lowest wages of any tracked professions in this county. So again, the same type of stuff that I'm thinking about for uh, you know the refugee that's going to benefit from having free fare, we're going to have the same types of benefits. If it's more, more food be able, being able to be put on the table, more doctor's visits that people can afford, and just a more comfortable life for a lot of people in this community and across the county, and I'm really excited for that. There is a nice pairing, as we've been saying, with that last item, and um, it, it does just strike me how both are really foundational in terms of improving the lives of a lot of people on an everyday basis, and um, that's not something you know, we'll see it, but it's it's so widely distributed and so foundational that it you know it doesn't necessarily make headlines uh, in the way that special events can. But uh, when you add it all up, it's a very significant achievement. I would also say one one other thing. I think I have um, asked uh, Katie and Missy uh, quite a few uh, questions during this period of, of deliberation, uh, and I have very much appreciated the responses that you've gotten uh, to me. And again, I, I, I am very clearly going to be go voting for this, so thank you very much for your hard work. I just want to say, as somebody who a million years ago was part of this coalition, but then, um, you know, I, I, Child care has so many layers to it. Um, the perfect metaphor is it's an onion. You peel back one, and there's more and more and more layers. And the thing that is so wonderful about this particular piece of the puzzle is that it is so concrete, and it helps in such a you know, pragmatic way to professionalize what is an incredibly difficult and specialized skill set and jobs. And um, 
before COVID, it was there are not enough slots. And of course, that also had to do with there not being enough workers. But post COVID, when it's such a low wage, and in so many ways, uh, with the state as well, making it more risky for people to be workers in this industry, I think that the more that can be done to help professionalize these workers um, in our community, the better, and to show that we value their work. And um, hopefully, you know, it's one toehold at a time, but this is an incredibly important effort. Um, and to bring attention to it really shows that, in fact, yes, Iowa City and the people in this community and the county are really working hard to shine a light on just how dire the crisis is and that there are ways to help mitigate it. And you can't fix childcare without attacking it piece by piece. And so thank you for doing that. There's been lots of words that's been shared by my fellow counselors. Um, I think what I wanted to uh, maybe just bring light to um, is that marketing. Make sure that the the workers that have already been in the system know that they're appreciated. You can give money, um, but I also believe that the words are so valuable um, and sometimes taken for granted that ah, just you know a, a, a little thank you for all you do might not be significant, but you'll be surprised. And when people are told thank you for the work that they do, how they really take that to heart. So great that we can give, uh, be a part of this $2 an hour, but also want to make sure that that marketing includes a thank you. <laughs> Roll call, please. Taylor? Yes. Teague? Yes. Thomas? Yes. Alter? Yes. Burgess? Yes. Dunn? Always. Harmson? Yes. Motion passes seven to zero. <laughs> Item number nine H, re removal of Parks and Recreation Commissioner. Uh, this is a resolution to remove Commissioner Member Boniface Penadajo Lam Mopa from the Parks and Rec Commission due to multiple unexcused absences. Can I get a motion to approve, please? So moved, Alter. Second, Thomas. Anyone from the public like to address this topic? Council discussion? Roll call, please. Teague? Yes. Thomas? Yes. Alter? <laughs> yes. Burgess? Yes. Dunn? Yes. Harmson? Yes. Taylor? Yes. Motion passes seven to zero. Item number 10 is council appointments, and we have several. Um, so I think how we're gonna do this is we're gonna go kind of one by one, um, and then at the end, we'll take a, we'll give our official vote, naming yeah, a mass motion for each of them. All right, so we will do first the Airport Commission, uh, 10A, which has one vacancy to fill a four-year term from July 1st, 2023 through June 30th, 2027. And there is no gender balance. And we had three applicants. Ryan's story really stood out to me. I agree with you yeah. also. Same. Same. I think I hear a majority. Yeah. Mm -hmm. okay. mm -hmm. Any other nominations? All right, so for Airport Commission, we have Ryan Story. Okay, uh, ten I'm sorry, there was correspondence that went with the Airport Commission that was in the late handouts yesterday. Great, could I get a, mo um, could I get a motion to accept correspondence? So moved, Harmson. Second, Burgess. All in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion passes seven to zero. Item number 10B is community Police Review Board, one vacancy to fill a four-year term, July 1st, 2023, through June 30th, 2027. It does have a female requirement. Mr. Mayor, I think in, in light of the fact that uh, um, the person whose term expires, Jerry McConnell, I think was just recently appointed, um, I would be, in, and they have uh, you know resubmitted an application, I, I would put them forward as um, as, as a nominee. I would agree with that, because that uh, 
one that uh, she was appointed to was uh, an unexpired term, so it wasn't even a full term that she filled. And just elected the chair, so the group apparently must think highly of somebody who's that new and already, you know, or yes. relatively new and, and has perfect that vote attendance. Of <laughs> and perfect <laughs> attendance. Any other nominations? I uh, hear no other nominations. Are people inclined to support the majority? Mm -hmm. yes. yes. Okay. We're going to move on to item 10C, Historic Preservation Commission at large. <laughs> Two vacancies to fill a three-year term, July 1st through 2023. Um, through June 30th, 2026. This does require two males. I think Frank uh, Wagner really stood out to me. He's on my list as well. Yeah. I was also interested in um, Andrew Lewis. Mm -hmm. Agreed. Yes. And, okay. Any other nominations? Are people inclined to support Andrew Lewis and Frank Wagner? Yes. I'm okay. okay with that. All right. We're moving on to item 10B. 10D, as in David. Okay. Historic Preservation Commission Longfellow. Uh, one vacancy to fill a three year term. July 1st, 2023 through June 30th, 2026. It has one male requirement. Carl, I was gonna suggest Carl Brown. He also has only served one term. Mm -hmm. I agree. Yep. Yeah, I agree. agree. Sure. All right, there's a majority there. And um, item 10E, we're going to come back to, um, because uh, Councilor Taylor will recruit them herself. Um, so we'll go on to item 10F, Lib Library Board of Trustees. And this is two vacancies for a six-year term, July 1st, 2023 through June 30th, 2029. Of one of them, I would... Um uh, put forth Claire Matthews. Agree. Agreed. I thought two others had, I mean, first of all, I want to say, I love that we're in a community that loves its library this much. The number of applicants, these are people after yes. my own heart. So um, with all the commissions and boards, but that's just one that, that uh, I don't know if every community has that, uh, that level of interest in the library board. Um, there were two on there that I would throw out as, as possibilities uh, in addition to um, uh, Ms. Matthews. Uh, Bonnie Boothroy and uh, Cecilia Green, did I? I'm trying to read my own. Lucille. Lucille. Lucilla. Lucilla. Lucilia, sorry. Sorry, I'm reading my own handwriting, so my <laughs> apologies. Um, they, I think they just both had uh, uh, really impressive resumes um, that, that jumped out at me, so I would see if any of the counselors um, had a particular thought on one of those or anybody else. Yeah, I, I agree with um, Councillor Harmson. Bonnie uh, Boothray uh, stood out to me, but also uh, Janine, is it Kane? Mm -hmm. um, she talked about the importance of literacy and the importance of supporting all students, uh, no matter what, mm. kind of fell into our strategic values as far as uh, inclusiveness and, and all persons. So I'd throw that name out there also. Any other nominations? All right, we have four so far. We have Bonnie, Lucille, Janine, and Claire. Wanted to see, I'll just, um, I'll go in the order of how they were called out. <laughs> okay. If I could remember, so uh, wanted to see hands of support for Claire. So, all right, we have majority there. Uh, wanted to see hands of support for Bonnie. Okay. Want to see hands of support for Lucille. I think we have majority there. All right, so Lucille Green and Claire Matthews.
All right, we're moving on to item 10G, Planning and Zoning Commission. Two vacancies to fill a five-year term, July 1st, 2023, through June 30th, 2028. And we have two males and one non. Mayor, the next item, it's also an unexpired, so there's two items, three terms. So we might as well just combine them. Okay, we'll do that. So item 10H is Planning and Zoning Commission. One vacancy to fill an unexpired term upon appointment through June 30th, 2026. But that's a part of the two males and one nine. And one nine, three, yes. a total of three. Yep, so we have a total of three for those two. I'll just throw out three names. Um, Michael Marut, Millie Townsend, and Chad Wade. I agree with all three of those. Both Billy and Chad were on my list as well. Yeah, Bill, uh, Billy and Chad are both already serving, and mm -hmm. so the the newcomer would be um, was it Michael? Michael Marut. No. I'm good with that. I think they're. I just want to throw this out as for a brief point of discussion is that in times past, based on the number of applicants, we have tried to do some turnover um, on the commissions. I'm playing my own sort of both sides. I do also recognize, especially um, in the past several instances, um, PNZ has, it's pretty specialized in uh, knowledge, so I certainly, I don't have an issue with um, having two experienced people come back on, um, but I just wanted to, to raise that. I, I realized it was not, it was more of a rule of thumb rather than a rule of law or anything that we had set forth, but I just, I did want to point that out that we've had conversations previous about um, uh, turning over commissions to give more people opportunities, but I also recognize P&Z is a little bit different, so I just wanted to throw that out there and see if that ref made anybody think differently. Well, I, I with all due respect, um, Mayor Pro Tem Alter, um, as you'd mentioned, yeah. planning and zoning is pretty intense, but uh, <laughs> so are some of the other ones. Oh, yeah. uh, and and I, I just really see value in, and some of these terms are just short, like three or four years. Mm -hmm. And uh, I think when these people want to put the time and effort into it, if they want to apply for a second term, um, so be it. And, and sure. I, I don't see any problem with that. That's no different from those of us running again yeah. for council. So yeah. um, I don't see any problem with, with reappointing folks. Yeah, I'm comfortable with the three that have been suggested. It is a long term, I will say. <laughs> but, but yeah, that's the, yeah. Um, I know I come, having served on PNZ, it is one where five year term, yeah. Five, yeah. Uh, yeah, there's a lot that can go into understanding the structure of our planning and zoning um, documents. So, I, you know, there's a learning curve there for sure. Um, so I, I would support reappointing, but it is a five years. I don't know who came up with that number, but it's, <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> Yes, that's a push, yes. especially doing it twice. <laughs> yeah. Got to keep right. our talent somehow. <laughs> All right. So it it appears that we have majority for Billy Townsend, Chad Wade, and Michael Marut. Mm -hmm. sure. Okay. Mr. Mayor, the one question I have is that two of those will be for a new five-year term, and one will be for an unexpired yes. term. And I think All the right. council will need to designate which is which. I looked at Kelly for a moment uh, to see whether the gender balance requirements, it looks like um, it, it was a male, Mark Sines, who is resigning uh, from the uncompleted term. So I would assume that we would want to place one of the male candidates you've addressed into the unexpired term. I don't think it matters. Doesn't it matter ultimately? Overall. Okay, yeah. great. Thanks. I would suggest uh, Michael for the, um, the three-year term. Or no, sorry, the unexpired, the unexpired term. term. I beg your pardon. I was doing the math. Anyone, are people okay with that? Okay, great. We're on to item number 10I, which is Public Art Advisory Committee. One at large vacancy to fill a three-year term, July 1st, 2023, through June 30th, 2026. One female and one non-requirement. How about Nate Sullivan? I 
think that's a good idea. All right. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yes. Great. It, one of his primary for reasons for none. applying was to um, advocate for the performing arts, mm -hmm. which is not really yeah. In, yeah. within the mm -hmm. scope, but just mm -hmm. to let that be known. All right. And then the other will just remain open, open until filled. Other. Because no, we do have two applicants no. for art oh, for, yeah. for the professional. Oh, see, it's the next one. Yeah, I always see. <laughs> so we'll do the both. Well, we'll go to the next one, which is Public Art Advisory Committee on 10J, one vacant city fill a three year term for an art or or design professional July 1st, 2023 through June 30th, 2026. And uh, this is another situation. Anita Young is uh, currently uh, filling an unexpired term, so mm -hmm. I, I would um, appoint her to that. Anita. Mm -hmm. Anita mm -hmm. Young. I agree. All right. So I think we are where we need to be. Except for the HCDs. For right. HCDs. Yeah. So what we're going to do is we're going to vote on this first. Oh, okay. Um, and then we will come back and vote on the next, on item 10E. All right, I'm just, um, I think I'm done here. So could I get a motion to approve uh, 10A Airport Commissioner, uh, Commission Story Ryan, uh, 10B CPRB Jerry McConnell, 10C, Historic Preservation at Large, uh, Andrew Lewis and Frank Wagner. 10D, uh, Historic Preservation Longfellow, Cara Brown. 10F, Library Board of Trustee, Claire Matthews and Lucille Green. Uh, 10G and H, Planning and Zoning, Billy Townsend, Chad Wade, Michael Marut, um, who will get the unexpired term. 10I is gonna be public Art Advisory at Large, Nate Sullivan, and then 10J is going to be Public Art um, Committee, Art or Design Professional, Anita Young. So moved. Done. Second, aye. Harmson. Moved by Don, seconded by Harmson. All in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion passes 7 to 0. And we're going to allow um, the re um, recusal of Councilor Taylor for item number 10E, Housing and Community Development Commission. There are three vacancies to fill a three-year term, July 1st, 2023 through June 30th, 2026. There are two males and one none. Lance Gleiser, someone who I caught my eye. I would throw out both Kieran uh, and Kyle um, to come back. I think this is probably one of those opportunities where we have three positions. HCDC does a lot of difficult work allocating funds and stuff like that, so we can do a mix of experience and get some new blood mm -hmm. in there. So I agree with that. I would yeah. agree. And I heard Kyle, who was the other? Lance Kleiser and Kieran Patel. Any other nominations? Okay, do we need to identify who gets what? <laughs> I, think, I think James Pierce would also do well if people would wanna choose. I, I mean, I, I would throw out James Pierce mm -hmm. as well as a I had him as well. All right, so mm. we have um, two males and one none. So we 
We have three males right now, if I... Kieran. No, Kieran's, Kieran's female. Oh, no. I'm sorry? Kieran Patel female. is female. female. Mm-hmm. mm-hmm. So we have two males and two, female, two females right now. Okay. I'm sorry, maybe I've got the names wrong. I have Lance Gleiser, who I haven't checked, but I assume is male. Kieran Patel, female. Kyle Vogel, male. And James Pierce, male. Is right. that right? Correct. We haven't decided. Right. Or, or, or is that, is it three or? Total of three four. that we're looking for. Right. So uh, we'll two of whom need decision. to be males sure. and one right. can be either. Okay. I thought there were three that identified as male. So, yeah. okay. So we have... Well, I guess the non we can determine, Kieran, you know, Kieran. who we want, because it's not a gender required. I mean, I would support Kieran regardless. So yeah, that'd be yeah. Very and cool. we just appointed her, didn't we? We did. Yeah, just yeah. not long last ago. year. Yeah. I'm pretty sure. So, so it sounds like there's majority support for Kieran. Mm-hmm. Um, so then let's look at two um, remaining that we want to support. So maybe I'll do them in the. I'll try to recall the order of the names as they were, as they were given. Um, Kyle yes, wanted to yes. see support. Yeah. So we have majority there. Um, and then Lance Gleiser. And then uh, James Pierce. Yeah, so we have, all right. So can I get a motion to appoint for Housing and Community Development Commission, um, Karen Patel, James Pierce, and Kyle Vogel. So moved, Harmson. Second, Alter. All in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion passes seven to zero. Great. Six zero. Six zero. Oh, yeah. oh. <laughs> motion passes six to zero with the one recruiter. Leave it to the lawyer to catch me. No, nope. technical... Kelly said it first. <laughs> I was just repeating to make of sure you heard. Of course, the city clerk <laughs> caught me. <laughs> All right. We are on to item 11, announcements of vacancies previous. Ad hoc truth and reconciliation commission. Two vacancies to fill an unexpired term upon appointment through December 31st, 2024. Uh, Human Rights Commission will vacancy to fill an unexpired term. Applications must be received by 5 p.m. Monday, July 3rd, 2023. Historic Preservation Commission Northside will vacancy to fill a three-year term. Historic Preservation Commission East College Street will vacancy to fill an unexpired term. Historic Preservation Commission Jefferson Street will vacancy to fill a three-year term. Historic Preservation Commission, Woodlawn Avenue, one vacancy to fill an unexpired term. Vacancies will remain open until filled. Item number 12 is City Council information. I just want to say again, it's uh, for several of us who were able to go to the Sunday day in the life of uh, duffers trying to be fire people. Um, It was an amazing training. It was incredibly um, instructive, valuable, exhilarating. Being able to use the jaws of life was pretty cool, but um, it also just gave a whole new insight into what it is like for the fire department. Um, And so I just greatly appreciate the effort that went into creating that for us, um, walking us through it, helping us not laughing at us all of that it was but no it was a tremendous experience and you know unfortunately with the fires that you have recently had to attend to um it made my reading of the articles utterly different than in times past so thank you very much for um extending that to us you know I wanted to uh, give a shout out to the Summer of the Arts program. Uh, I attended the Arts Festival this weekend, and it appeared to be very successful, hundreds if not thousands of people downtown. It was just great to see downtown so vibrant and so full of people of, of diverse backgrounds that, that we love to tout ourselves as, as a city of. Um, and of course, all the wonderful vendors. I saw some from Colorado and Wisconsin and Illinois. They came from all over and had wonderful, uh, wonderful products. Uh, but there were also some unique things that some of you might have 
of Mista, one that caught a lot of attention. There were two little Sheltie dogs, if you know what Shelties are. They're like the little miniature collies. They had sunglasses on, and people were just really getting a kick out of that. It was really cute, and they were stopping the people to take pictures of these little dogs with sunglasses. It was just adorable. Um, then there was the uh, man on stilts. He was like over seven foot tall, and that's for a five foot two person. That's, that's really tall, and, and he had a bubble machine, and that was also like really uh, drawing people, especially the young people, to him, and that was really fun to see. And then um, my, my favorite was what appeared to be uh, a, a brass sculptor. I don't know if those of you who attended saw this or not. It was, it was um, a young man fi with a fishing pole. And at first I thought, oh my goodness, we've got another new brass sculptor in, in Blackhawk Mini Park. Cause I, he just stood there still like a statue, and he was painted like, like brass, and it was just amazing. But then every now and then he would slowly move and, and startle the crowd. But that was just really amazing. And something I was, I was expecting to go down and shop for, for artwares, but seeing those kinds of things also, it was really fun. Uh, just a congratulations to all of the various graduates uh, over the past couple of weeks, um, as well as for the other students in ICCSD who had their last day of school today, and I'm sure they're much, much happier tonight than they were last night. So. <laughs> <laughs> and just a reminder, the two proclamations that we gave was Juneteenth mm -hmm. and Iowa City Prize, so there's events happening. Um, look at the website. It's going to be exciting. It's going to be hot, um, but come in and celebrate uh, these two and commemorate as well. All right, we're on to items number 13, uh, reports from city staff, our city manager's office. Not tonight, Mayor. Our city attorney. Uh, nothing tonight. <laughs> All right, and our city clerk. All right. And item number 14 is a motion to adjourn. Could I get a motion, please? So moved, Fergus. Second, alter. All in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion passes seven to zero.